for joining us, everyone. We've got people calling in from all over. It's pretty fun. Uh, if you're new to archive dives, we dive deep into archive papers. Uh, we feel like reading these archive papers is one of the best ways to learn the fundamentals, but also stay up to date with the cutting edge research and not just get it from Twitter or X threads, but like get it from the researchers themselves. So today we're gonna be going over a paper called Fast Speech 2, which is all about generating speech from text, uh, which I think is one of the one of the cool domains. And if you think of like all of the senses that we have as humans, we have you know, obviously visual and auditory, and unfortunately computers can't do taste or smell yet. But this is one of the key uh, aspects to intelligence is just like processing audio and speaking or generating audio. So I think that's a fun, fun reason to dive into it. Uh, we have this shared notion doc that I'll toss in the chat here if you want to follow along live. And I will put the link to the paper at the top there if you want to follow along with the paper um oh and there's a fun uh pytorch implementation of this if you even really want to dive deeper that i'll i'll put in here too okay cool so this paper was uh first released by microsoft in june of 2022 it's been updated a few times since then which i thought was interesting uh i didn't even know that you could update archive papers but i saw it was most recently updated like a month ago so i don't know what they edited or uh added there like i said i think audio is fascinating it doesn't get as much attention as the llms or computer vision and honestly is a space that i've probably worked in the least. So at the start of this, I'm going to define a lot of terms just to like get us on the same page. If you're not an audio engineer, some of these things can be intimidating, but if you kind of break them down to their core fundamentals, uh, they're not they're not that bad. So what are we building? It's a text-to-speech engine. So that's just like taking a line of text and generating audio. There's a bunch of examples at this URL here. If you guys want to go and just like listen to some of them, that might be fun actually just to do live. Um, and I hope that the audio <laughs> plays through, but we will find out. Um, let's see. And I also have the data set up here that we're going to dive into a little later to show you the ins and outs. So they have a bunch of the older models, Fast Speech, Fast Speech 2, and then Fast Speech 2S is like the super fast version of it. Um, but let's see if this plays through. If it doesn't, no problem. You can No, it's not playing. Well, you guys can click through this. It, it sounds very uh, newsy and like a news reporter just reading a line. Um, but if you click into the data that it was trained on, that's also what that data set sounds like. So not super surprising. Um, cool. So a little bit of background knowledge. Um, like I said, if you haven't worked in speech or audio engineering, um, these terms are going to be very useful to follow along. So the first one is just a waveform. Um, so if you have like a audio file under the hood, you, you might have seen something like this, like as audio is playing, but it's basically if you're thinking about a audio clip, they have different sample rates. A lot of them might be at like 
44,000 samples per second. So if you thought of like a two minute audio clip, that would be over 5 million samples or a lot of the data in this training set are five to second, five to 10 second clips. So you can think of those as just like uh, 200,000 numbers that are fluctuating in value here. Um, so that's kind of going to be one of the base inputs to these models. I thought there was a great uh, tutorial, and I'm, I'm going to link to like a lot of external resources here that helped me learn what was going on. Um, but this shows you how to just like plot waveforms in Python and play with them. The next thing we kind of need to know is what's called a MEL spectrogram. So this is like the next step, the next level of detail to be able to feed uh, a waveform into a neural network. And again, there's a great resource here that I'm going to take some of the visuals from. Um, but so this is like another example of a waveform. This is a very long waveform here. This is a shorter one that's actually a whale song that is kind of fun. Um, so you can see it's only 40 seconds long, but it's very, you can really see when the frequencies get high and low. Um, and depending on how high or low these things are, you're going to have different sounds coming out. So like if it's very high frequency and very high amplitude, that might be like a bike horn versus like a very long one and slow drawn out one might be more like a uh, deep car horn. Um, but if you take these and you want to feed it into a neural network, they convert it into what's called a MEL spectrogram, uh, which really just converts it into an image. Um, a lot of neural networks work or have been designed to work with images. So uh, that's like one of the reasons that we convert the waveform to a MEL spectrogram. And you can think of it as frequency in hertz on one axis, time on the other axis, and then kind of like the depth or color dimension is the amplitude and of, of the sound at that point in decibels, if you've ever heard of that term before, like if you're, you're in a stadium and they're like, oh, let's get the decibels up to and break the world record. That's just kind of like how loud the sound is. Um, and it's interesting because humans can actually only hear certain frequencies. So this blog post pointed out that if you just made a spectrogram of something like this and didn't normalize the values to put it into like a range that humans could understand, it actually just looks like a very black chart. So you have to, if you look at the Y axis here, you have to put it into a range that humans can understand from like zero to eight, 92 versus zero to 10,000. Um, and just a fun fact there, you might know that like dogs can hear much higher frequencies than us. So I thought this was a funny meme of this, this very uh, trendy dog who trying to be on the cutting edge of frequencies. Um, they also mention that uh, they just use phonemes as the level of inputs. So this is going to be a unit of speech. Um, so when we did a lot of the LLM stuff, we talked about tokens, which was like breaking down words and having the smallest amount of word input into these neural networks. They also, uh, when processing the text part of this data, they break it down into the smallest unit of distinguishable speech. So you could think of a phoneme if you have the words tab, tag, or tan. Ta is a phoneme, and then p is a phoneme, or b, or n. Um, so they break down the text a little differently than they would in a large language model. And 
um, there's a nice GitHub repository that'll do that for you. Um, and then I think the other two pretty important concepts are auto-regressive as you're reading the paper versus non-auto-regressive. Auto-regressive is just like predicting the next thing from the previous thing, um, very similar to the large language model work, but it can be really computationally expensive if the sequence is really long. Uh, so if you think about like a two minute audio clip and you have those 5 million examples, auto-regressive techniques can be really slow when you're trying to like predict one thing from the previous thing because it depends on each other as you're going along. So they really emphasize when they're generating the audio, they do it in a non-auto regressive way, um, which is really inspired by this WaveNet paper from before. Um, so with all those terms <laughs> defined, I think we can like dive into what the actual paper does and we can refer back to the, to the images as we go. Um, but, the idea is they wanted a pure uh, neural network based way of generating this audio. And they state that text to speech has made a lot of progress in recent years um, with the use of neural networks. And that um, previous neural text to speech models first generate MEL spectrograms auto regressively from the text. And then they synth synthesize speech from those spectrograms with a separately trained, they call it a vocoder that would just go from uh, this spectrogram out to a waveform. So if you think of the full pipeline of a text to speech thing, it's gonna be like text in some sort of intermediate representation um of the text that the model can take and then a lot of these models would go from that intermediate representation of text to a spectrogram and then sorry i can't spell right now spectro gram and then they would take that and go to a waveform um and they're trying to like skip this step right here um for some of their work. They say that um, the auto regressive models like we talked about before are really slow. Uh, so that's one of the things that they're trying to improve in the, the fast part of fast speech too. Um, and they run all of these training and experiments on this LJ speech data set, which is a relatively small data set when we're thinking about like the scale that some of these LLMs are trained on. Um, we'll dive into the details there later. Um, but there's kind of two models. It's fast speech two and fast speech two S. The two S one is like the super fast one, but they both go through a very similar process of they take in the phonemes, they encode them, they have a module in the middle that does some cool transforms um, on the waveforms themselves to try to predict like what was the pitch, what was the energy, what was the duration um, that they claim give a lot of character to the voice when it comes out the other end and make it less monotone and uh, less generic. So that's kind of what this variance adapter is. And then depending on if it's fast speech or fast speech two, they either do the MEL spectrogram route or they just have a waveform decoder that goes directly from the latent space to a waveform. Um, and then the way you can read this diagram is this is the full architecture. And then each one of these are sub modules within here. So like this is the variance adapter right here. Um, 
within the variance adapters, there's duration, pitch, and energy predictors that are kind of like this. And then this is the waveform decoder that's over here. Um, but it took me a second to like wrap my brain around which component was watch what. And this is kind of the whole full architecture and these are the sample ones. Um, they mention that text itself is a very low information input to capture all of the vari variation of speech. Um, and so everybody has a different voice, accent, pitch, volume. And that's really what this variance adapter is in here to do, is to model all of those things. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into how they actually do that. But the overall model architecture, we, we kind of saw it in the diagram here, but they have an encoder that converts the phonemes. Um, so this might even be helpful to dive into the actual um, an actual example here, which I will pull up in Oxen. So we have the full data set here. It's like 3.8 gigabytes. Um, there's a bunch of waveform files uh, that look like what we saw before. You can play them right there. And then there's a bunch of labeled data, train, validation, and test here. And um, so you might have a transcript that says, like, five or six years later, William Rupel minutely described how he had affected the fraud. And the phonemes that would come out of that are like F, so F, and then I, <laughs> and like they're breaking down, you can see into each syllable of this word. So five gets translated into that, and then or gets translated into like O and R, <laughs> and so on. Um, so what the model actually sees is something more like this, um, which is pretty entertaining. And they also, if you look at some of these, you'll notice that there's a transcript and a normalized transcript. Um, and I wonder if I can find an example in here, but oh, this one's a good one. So just the difference between these two is it's really hard to have numbers translated into phonemes. So they actually do another step where they translate the numbers into words and then the words into phonemes. Um, so if you're wondering why there's like transcript and normalized transcript, it's kind of a three-step process to get to these things. Um, so that gives you a sense of what a phoneme is, how it's going to go into the model there. And when they say they have a phoneme encoder, it's very similar to like, uh, transformer or BERT or any of those things where they're taking that phoneme sequence and putting it into a latent space embedding that they, they can then learn off of. Um, once they have the phonemes in the latent space with the neural network, then the variance adapter adds in information about the pitch, energy, and duration um, to the latent space. Um, so what they do is they have in the training data, they're, they're able to extract these things from the actual audio. And then just from the raw phonemes, they're trying to predict what would be an example pitch and energy and like duration of this exact phoneme for this example. So like uh, some people might draw out their O's a little longer and be a little louder. So they're trying to predict like for this sentence in general, how long would the O's be or how high would the pitch be? Or if there's an exclamation point at the end of the sentence, maybe that increases the energy. Um, so they're trying to have the model, since they already have this information in the training data, they're trying to not only predict the waveform from the 
phonemes are from the text, but intermediately they're trying to predict what would the durations of these phonemes be? What would the pitch of them be? What would the energy of them be? And they said that adding this extra step of extra predictions in the middle just gives the model much more uh, robust sounding outputs. And they do some ablation studies on that. Um, so finally, depending if you're going down the fast speech two or fast speech two S route, um, they either generate a MEL spectrogram, that kind of image that we saw earlier from the latent space, or they generate a waveform directly. Um, for both of these, they do use transformer blocks um, kind of in the encoder step. Um, so they do, when they say it's like a non auto regressive model, that's mainly for this last step here. Um, but for processing the phonemes, they use a transformer like we've seen in a lot of the text space. Um, but for fast speech two, they simplify it even for two S, they simplify it even more just to generate the waveform. Um, and if you ever hear the word vocoder, that just means like waveform decoder. Um, and sometimes you'll hear like acoustic model or something that generates a ML spectrogram. Um, so I already talked about the variance adapter a little bit. This is how they capture all the nuance. Um, the duration predictor takes in the latent space and predicts the duration of each phoneme. Uh, they use a tool called MFA to, to do this. It's an open source tool to just extract the durations of phonemes from um, actual audio sequences. The pitch predictor tries to predict the pitch of each frame. Um, and then the energy predictor uh, uses some fancy math and tries to predict the energy of, of the audio. And you can think of energy as just like the, the volume, um, the volume of it. And pitch is more like the emotions and pattern and rhythm of it. Um, so then fast speech two, they get rid of the Mel spectrogram part. Um, they said that the main reason for this is that waveforms contain uh, a lot more data than the Mel spectrogram. So when you convert to the Mel spectrogram, you lose a lot of information. Um, but the waveforms are like a very long sequence and they're limited by GPU memory. So this is like the trade-off that they're trying to make is like, do we lose information and work in the Mel spectrogram space or do we try to be, try to process the whole thing and we're just limited by like compute at that, at that step. Um, so the, again, a lot of these papers, like the actual depth of the model besides this high level diagram is all in one paragraph here. And they link out to like three or four other papers that you would have to read fully to understand each component. Um, but within there, they talk about their full method and how the waveform decoder at the end is based off of this WaveNet paper uh, that has special convolutions and gated activations to actually generate that waveform. Um, they do have some GAN techniques in the middle um, to, if, you, if you're familiar with GANs, just like one's trying to generate the audio and one's trying to predict if the audio was generated or was real. Um, and so it's funny, like, like I think we've seen in a lot of these papers, the, the real meat is just like 
putting together a lot of concepts from other papers and putting it into this one model. And uh, unfortunately, didn't have enough time in the week to dive into every one of these things. But I think the high level architecture is still um, a good takeaway and makes sense. Um, let's see. Let's dive into what uh, they actually trained the data or what they actually trained the model to do in some results. So that LJ speech data set had 13,000 English audio clips, which is only about 24 hours of audio in the text transcripts. When, and so when I was saying it was small before, I think you know you compare that to some of the large language model foundation model data sets that we've seen out there. And like this data set was four gigabytes of audio versus some of those, even from like the GPT two days uh, was like 40 gigabytes of text data. And I think, or I don't think I know <laughs> there's way more audio on the internet than 24 hours. Like people probably listen to more podcasts or YouTube videos of that in, in a week. Um, so I think there's a lot of area to improve here. Um, they split that data into um, training, validation, and test data sets. For speech, it's really hard to quantitatively assess a lot of these things. So they also randomly sample 100 just for subjective evaluation um and just some other statistics about the data set there's only um 200,000 words and like a million characters um in the whole data set so again pretty small compared to these other uh like large language model data sets i'm sure some companies are working on putting together a much bigger version of this. Um, yeah, I was all the gonna, clips. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask this a second ago about like the kind of average clip length going in and the effects that that has on like the kind of longer range dependencies of the output. Just because I yeah. know even before the, I don't know if this is correct to say, but it feels like the text and LOM side of things is maybe like a little bit further on in terms of like closeness to human performance than the audio stuff is, at least over long range. I just remember how it used to be really good, even with like bag of words type modeling at generating a couple of words or a couple of sentences, but then really started to hit a wall in long range dependencies. Do you see that same kind of thing going on here um, because of the training data? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I think half of it's because the training data is, uh, one, it's, it's way easier to label just like these one sentence at a time things than to try to like type out a whole podcast. So like chunking it into that length mm. just kind of makes sense. And then for two, uh, if you just think of the sample size of each one of those, how much data you're trying to generate in the waveform. Um, if you're trying to generate 200,000 values for like a five second clip, then yeah, that's like a way longer sequence to try to keep all i mean in a transformer that's just unreasonable because uh you you see like a 4k context window for like some of these things so if you think of like a 200k context window for audio that's getting super computationally expensive yeah and then when they do um kind of the more wave netty approach um, they said that these audio files are sampled a little lower, so it's not that 41,000, but they chop them into like uh, 1024 sized frames, and then they skip over 256 values each time. So they are doing some hacks to like try to make the data smaller, but as you do those hacks, you like lose data along the way, and then you lose long range dependencies. So I could see Maybe for human speech, it's a little less uh, important, but I could see like music 
generation or something like that where you need all the complexity of each one being a little more complicated and harder to do. Yeah. I know you did a little digging in the music generation stuff. Does any anything pop out there? Yeah, at least um, when we were going over the generative, I forget the title of the book, but they linked out to some examples of um, audio generated like in the style of Bach or like in the style of Chopin. And they would do really, really well kind of measure to measure. Um, but like like you said, there's kind of no underlying structure to the piece. It would just kind of wander off into the wilderness and, and continue to develop, you know, locally stylistically consistent music. Um, but over the long range, you're like, what, are we even in the same you know universe uh, that we started in? So definitely, definitely rings out. And then remind me, were those ones, were they converting it to like a MIDI format? And then playing that, yeah. it wasn't like yeah. the that raw. Wasn't even direct audio processing. It was kind of like on the notes themselves, which is interesting because there's such a, you know, with written classical music having a graphical language, I'm sure it's really easy to convert that to training data without kind of having to go through the audio stuff, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I think that is one of the big takeaways from audio processing in general. As I've read these, is like there's a lot of these hacks to get these giant waveforms into a. Uh, more reasonable size that a neural network could work with. And then you lose information in the process. Cool. Um, in terms of training and inference time, since it is called fast speech, that is one of the things that they're optimizing for. Um, and it honestly didn't like, and again, I guess I'm comparing these to the large language model um, type workflows. But for fast speech two, it only took around 17 hours to train the whole model on, uh, granted it is a pretty big NVIDIA V100 DPU, but compared to the language modeling thing, which takes like weeks or months to train, um, this is a pretty reasonable iteration time. And then they also compare like, they call it uh, the real-time factor. So how quickly can you uh, time in seconds required for the system to synthesize one second of waveform? Um, so for example, fast speech 2S takes 0.18 seconds to synthesize one second of audio, which is really nice for like, real-time applications if you had a mobile fitness app like scott and i built and you wanted the trainer to uh say something but have it be dynamic throughout text you want that to be really quick um so that you could say different things at different times and you're not waiting um computationally to generate that audio um and these were just some other like computational resources that I extracted from here, but they had like a pretty beefy machine, but honestly something that you could rent in AWS for a day and probably wouldn't break the bank to reproduce this. Like it, it might cost you a couple hundred bucks. Um, and they do have some quantitative metrics of how aligned the phoneme boundaries are of the generated audio and how close the distributions are like from a waveform perspective to the ground truth, but it is really hard to uh, fully quantify those things because uh, speech is another one of those things that there's, <laughs> for one piece of text, there's almost infinite number of correct answers. like. Did I say it or did Ben say it or did a woman read it or did somebody with an accent read it? So like just going from the text to, is this a correct audio phrase uh, does take some subjective evaluation too. So they mentioned that as being one of the hard ways to evaluate it. Um, overall, I think these end-to-end -end speech recognition models is like a pretty challenging pro problem but being able to do it without 
a lot of like external tools and having it be end to end trainable with a neural network is starting to become achievable. Um, in my opinion, they don't train it on that much data compared to the foundation models. Um, I compared it to like how many podcasts I listen to. And I think you could imagine a pipeline and I'm sure that one of the big AI companies are trying to do that right now where you take podcasts or YouTube videos and you use a text or a speech to text model like Whisper to translate the audio to text. Um, you, they might have like a human in the loop verifying this stuff, but like just generating a hundred X of this, I feel is gonna give you a hundred X performance. Um, and we've seen this pattern in a lot of the meta papers where like they'll take a base model um, and they'll generate a bunch of data for it. And then they'll have humans in the loop, just like verifying, cleaning up, and then they'll train the next version of the model. And then they'll keep iterating on the data and the model at the same time. And I just think there's like so much content out there that it's pretty impressive that they can get the results they do with just this, but just imagine how, how much access some of these companies have to audio data that you could um, generate all sorts of speech. I would love to see some stats on getting these models to run uh, more on the edge, like on CPU or mobile devices, especially for use cases like I talked about with maybe it's like a personal trainer fitness app where you need to like generate the audio on the fly and even tie that to a large language model to maybe the large language model decides on what the text is and then text to speech says the thing like it just feels like these two things in parallel and tandem and running on the edge could build some really cool experiences um and i also think that it's interesting to use some of the internal representations of these generative models to just like improve an entire multimodal engine in general because if you think of like how humans process data we're processing audio and text and video and putting all of these things together and i have a feeling in a sense that like if you're able to generate human speech from text, then there's some level of understanding within that model that maybe you can merge with an LLM or even merge with video has all three where it might be a video of somebody speaking the audio and the text. And I would love to see more like multimodal of these things, putting it all together. Um, but I would love to hear if anybody in the audience has worked with speech in the past or just like high level um is this cool what would you use it for just kind of want to open it up to the to the crowd okay maybe this is harsh but to some extent it feels like the state of audio processing or audio deep learning today is similar to the state of vision 10 years ago. Like this model has pretty strong inductive biases. You're looking at specifically pitch, what was it, duration, energy, and baking those things in when it seems like maybe we do have enough data to just have a model learn those inductive biases, just like going from text or vision to training on huge, huge amounts of text and vision data with large language models and foundation models and stuff like this. And we're really not at that state yet for audio, it looks like. It, do, you, do you all agree? Like, that's just the impression that I got. Yeah, I totally agree. Those feel like hacks uh, for the fact that they only had 24 hours of English audio in there. And uh, we've seen kind of this, like, <laughs> there's the Jan Lacoon picture of, like, the cake, and it's, like, pre-training versus fine tuning versus like reinforcement learning. And I feel like you could do a ton of pre-training on audio, just even if it's as simple as like, take the first second 
and predict the second second and do something like that over and over again. I bet if you did that on enough, on enough data with enough compute, you would learn all of those things that you just mentioned. Was that kind of what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and even like even without needing to rely on just that kind of like pre-training or self-supervised stuff, which is obviously going to be a big part of it, it feels like there's so much more just well-structured, well-annotated, uh, like supervised data for this out there. I'm thinking of like first-party YouTube captions that like for accessibility reasons, like most large channels will kind of have someone write their captions in a variety of languages too, which has interesting translation cases. It's like there's a ton of stuff right there, but I guess. The primary limitation is, is as we talked about earlier, kind of around the just sheer amount of of data um, that's coming from those initial waveforms and how to get that into uh, a format where you can start to model more long range dependencies without everything catching on fire. So that might be kind of a preemptive answer because I was going to comment slash question. You know, given that this is the case, it kind of begs the question of why. Yeah. You know, um, if it's if it is that obvious i wonder if there's like a use case thing as well i feel like people uh when they think of computer vision or they think of natural language processing they're like oh chatbot oh uh autonomous vehicle oh whatever but then when i think of audio i can start to think of some use cases i think descript is a really cool product that does stuff like this where you can take a transcript of like this and I could make myself say something different or like remove an um or or something like that. Um, but I think you, it could be use case driven too of just like what companies have the incentive to train a model like this. Yeah, and the other thing is that like, despite feeling like kind of still in those backwoods of the way that vision was and the way that speech was, or in the way that, that language was, the models at least, so I've been talking to ChatGPT lately. I don't know if anybody's gotten that feature on the iOS app. And it's pretty good. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think there's also more tolerance there for the, like, subtleties of, oh, yeah, it didn't pick up on that long-range dependency or correctly back reference with its pitch to something it was talking about at the beginning of the sentence. But I'm still, like, on a walk and able to, like, brainstorm with ChatGPT now, and it works. So it's it's interesting. I don't know if it's, like, the the bar for acceptability and, and productionizing that is lower maybe it's not but it kind of feels like it uh just in how they sound to me hmm. yeah scott what other use cases can you think of um you put in hey gen there as well yeah that's this one where they um I, we actually saw the presentation greg when you presented in santa monica that one time but uh, the concept there is like record yourself a couple times on video and upload it and they make like an avatar version of you. Uh, but it, I mean, it's supposed to, it's like photorealistic, but it's, it's you, but you could just like feed it things to make a video on. So it's generative on, it's actually, I guess it's not generative on the audio side. Uh, it is so. Yeah, yeah, it generates right. the video and, the and your voice. Yeah, it generates the video and the voice and it keeps them obviously synced enough that it seems pretty it's pretty darn good it's like 99 percent where it feels like it's you yeah that's kind yeah, of I think for doing that world to me like i i, I don't know maybe I, I guess the pitch on the website is like no script no camera or no camera no setup no problem but uh, i don't know it freaks me out yeah <laughs> there's it also makes me think of um like musicians and artists i've seen a lot of like oh here's the ai Drake voice, or here's if Miley Cyrus sang a Taylor Swift song or something like that. So I feel like there's a lot of use cases in the in the music domain, but also like, uh, I don't want to say dangerous, but just we got to figure out what the laws are <laughs> around that. Um, and I'm sure that's a, a battle they're fighting, but also like an interesting tool for them to use as well if they don't want to go into the studio and record their actual voice. But like we see this with electronic music all the time. You can just have like a one man band in with his Mac and then he could make a entire symphony that he can go and perform at Red Rock. So it's like, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting back and forth with this technology. Yeah, that was the new that was the headline today is uh, Universal Music. Sued Anthropic. 
Um, so it's, you know, they're, they're obviously trying to import a lot of audio now, but it's also showing up in places. Mm -hmm. I think it's just interesting. I'm sure you guys saw um, Meta has like a couple of celebrities that they kind of introduced like a conversational or a chat function with. And I thought what was the most interesting about that was actually the the comments that came out of it. And it was mostly just like people did not actually understand that this was totally generated. They couldn't understand why Kendall Jenner was being given a different name. It was like, this is Kendall Jenner. What are you talking about? So I think it's really interesting to just see like how these use cases actually evolve and kind of where that line is drawn around kind of understanding like what it is versus what it isn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. God, that's yeah. that's exactly what it's on about. Really good chat, but yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. Like, I guess we're so deep in it that you're just like, oh yeah, things can get generated. But to just the general audience, they're like, wait. And I know, I, I think, Meta used Snoop Dogg as an example where they partnered with him to get his likeness. And I think they are paying him and, and all this sorts of stuff, but it is confusing to an end user. Like, did Snoop Dogg actually just like give me a shout out or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think the legal, the legal side of all of this is gonna be fascinating just to see how it unfolds. And obviously, and generally speaking, like the legal system moves so much slower. Um, so I wonder what the lag effect is is going to end up having as well. Yeah, and open source is starting to move so fast too that like, I mean, if you think of this bottle that took 24 hours and only cost you a couple hundred bucks to like rent a GPU like that, anybody could kind of just do this on their own time at this point, so. It's going to be interesting. Any other thoughts? Love it. I'll put some of these links that you put in here, Scott, um, into the bottom of the Did talk box. much about the like fine tuning process or anything like this. Is this all pretty standard as well? Um, or I'm guessing that the data that they had was just general and that they, they then fine tune it on some specific voices. Is that the case? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. This one actually didn't have any fine tuning. Um, it was just pure, let's train on this LJ speech data set. I think. Uh, okay, that's surprising. I, yeah, and I bet, I bet there are papers out there that have done like a more bigger pre training and then they learn just generic things about voice. And then they're like, here's all the Joe Rogan podcasts. <laughs> Let me just fine tune on him. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to find a paper that was like more uh, voice transfer, or voice fine tuning, or like, how do you get from a generic model to a specific person or a specific style accent? Um, yeah. But yeah the, well, I mean, I think this is related to this discussion about music or something like do you happen to know how they did it for what was it drake uh something i like don't that? um but i think okay. fine tuning it's it's like one of those things and i think to my point earlier that there's infinite outputs given one input like you could have the same rap lyric and have Nas or Drake or Biggie or Tupac, and they're all like valid responses. That's where I feel like fine tuning on specific ones or having some sort of um, conditional input or prompting is super interesting to be like, no, this time I want to generate it like this style. This time I want to generate it like that style. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you find um, any papers like that, let us know. And we have like a Discord with a bunch of, we just put some papers in there and then we'll vote on them and we can okay. cover it in a, I in mean, a next one. I imagine you could certainly do it with like standard fine tuning techniques. Like, uh, yeah. I would be surprised if you couldn't. Yeah, totally. And you just need like a data set. And yeah, that feels like a, I'm sure there's so many people trying that right now. <laughs> Cool. 
Well, that's all I had. I'm going to put all of this, all the notes, um, the video, everything on our blog. We'll post it in our Discord if you want this just for later reference or to dive deeper into any of the links about um, audio processing. But thanks for joining, everyone. Um, and vote on the net paper for next week. And who knows? Maybe we'll stay in audio. Maybe we'll go for video. Uh, the world's our oyster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.